All right, here is the scenario. You want a four wheel drive that can fit the family in and go off road, but you want to spend around $50,000, but you don't want to buy a second hand. You want something brand new. There are some options available to you these days, and they're a little bit different and they're new to the Australian market. There are things like Land Cruisers and Patrols and Land Rover Defenders available, but they more often than not cost a bit more than $100,000 and beyond. Not everyone has that kind of money to spend, but you can still get something pretty cool, a little bit funky, fit the family in and go off-road for around 50 grand. And we've got two options here that do exactly that. This one is from China. This is the GWM Tank 300. And on the other side here is the Mahindra Scorpio. It is from India. And these are both promising to be great value options for someone who wants to buy brand new. But which one is the best? Which is the best value as well? Well, let's have a closer look and find out. The GWM Tank 300 Ultra is priced from $50,990 before on-road costs and presents the higher trim grade available with the lower powered non-hybrid powertrain option. There is plenty of kit included here like 18 inch alloy wheels, Nappa leather seats with electric adjustment, heating, massage and ventilation in the seats, there's a heated steering wheel as well, an upgraded Infinity sound system, wireless phone charging, twin 12.3 inch displays for infotainment and driver display, a 360 degree camera system and diff locks front and rear. Under the bonnet of the Tank 300 is a two litre turbocharged petrol four cylinder engine, which makes 162 kilowatts and 380 newton meters. That runs through an eight speed automatic gearbox with part time four wheel drive. On the off-road front, the Tank 300 gets 224 mils of ground clearance, a 33 degree approach angle and 34 degree departure angle. There's independent front suspension and a live rear axle, along with low range, a part-time four-wheel drive system and selectable driving modes. The Mahindra Scorpio comes in at a lower price, $44,990 drive away. And that's for this top Z8L specification. For that money, you get an 8-inch infotainment display, brown leatherette materials, 18-inch alloy wheels, projector LED headlights, but only the driver's seat gets electric adjustment. Other bits include a 12-speaker sound system, which is Sony branded, front camera, front parking sensors, and a wireless charging pad. Compared to petrol power, the Mahindra Scorpio gets diesel and it's a 2.2 litre four cylinder turbo diesel engine here. It makes 129 kilowatts and 400 newton meters and that runs through a six speed automatic gearbox with a part time four wheel drive system. And like the Tank 300, there is also a low range transfer case. On the off road front, the Mahindra Scorpio gets a part time four wheel drive system with an auto locking rear differential, 227 mils of ground clearance, a 27.2 degree approach angle and 21.3 degree departure angle. Before I run you through the interior of this Tank 300, I just want to point out something about the key in this car. Here is the key here. The car has remote central locking, it's got keyless entry and push button start. Not a bad thing for a car at this price. And well, the interior, which I will get to in a minute, is impressive for the price as well. But listen to this. Can you hear that? Ready? It's near my microphone. There is a rattle in this key, which is a little bit annoying, but it is an easy fix at least. You can pop this open here. You push that logo there. That is a T logo, as in tank. And the rattle is actually coming from the physical key that you need in case the battery goes flat. So that's not rattling anymore. I reckon you could stick a tiny little bit of rubber in there, a bit of rubber band or something maybe. We'll fix that problem. So that is all good. Now, back to the rest of the car. This interior, like I said, is impressive for the money. Think about what you get in a Wrangler for about $90,000 by the time you're on the road. Think about a Toyota Fortuner for about $50,000 in its base specification. This is very nice. First thing that catches my eye is these air vents. I've seen those almost exactly the same in some very expensive Mercedes-Benz models, even with that ambient lighting around the end of it there. It's a nice look, 
it definitely brings up the ambience in this car a bit. You do have a bit of extra ambient lighting around the place. You've got quilted, padded, stitched leather on the doors. You've got nice, comfortable seats here. This doesn't feel like a cheap four-wheel drive in any sense of the word. And in terms of practicality, it's not bad either. So we've got a wireless charging pad here. There's a 12 volt, there's a USB, there is a USB-C. The center console is a decent size. You can open the little vent there to get a bit of air conditioning in there. Maybe you're carrying sandwiches or something like that. And you've got a sliding bin here, which reveals two cup holders. If you don't tend to drink much, you can pull those cup holders out and you've got additional storage in there. So in terms of everyday usage, this isn't too bad. But one thing I do like, I have to say, is the sense of build quality in this car. It does feel quite well put together and solid everywhere. Nice big Jesus bar in front of the passenger there. That's handy for going off-road. Got some nice soft materials up on the dash, but it, it feels good. It feels solid. It definitely doesn't feel anywhere near the kind of price they're asking. And that's, I think, the big appeal about this car. Now, in terms of infotainment, we've got two displays here. It's made to look like one, but there is a big infotainment display there, big landscape style thing. You've got Apple CarPlay, Android Auto. There isn't any navigation in there, and there isn't digital radio either, which is a little bit of a shame, I suppose, but you tend to forget about that very quickly once you plug your phone in, because I do like the quality of the screen. It's easy to use from the touchscreen point of view, and boot times aren't too bad either, so it's a good quality system. And this one in the front of the driver here is nice as well. You'll probably notice that as soon as you get onto an angle from the passenger seat, you can't see it, but I guess that doesn't really matter because this is for the driver. There is a bunch of different outputs you can get on here, mostly to do with fuel economy and driver assistance systems and that sort of thing, but it looks quality and it feels good. And once again, for the price, it's very impressive. Here's the second row of the Tank 300. And the first thing I notice when I get in is that this seating position is quite car-like, I suppose, in comparison to some other four-wheel drives out there that have a raised seating position in the back. This is relatively low, definitely comfortable. And in comparison to the Mahindra, we do have three seats across the back here. So in two-seat mode, it is pretty comfortable. There is a pop-down armrest with cup holders there, but if you want to squeeze five in, you can in this car. Now I do notice these speakers in the back here, they are similar to the ones up the front and they are also, let's say, inspired by a Mercedes-Benz design, which I've seen quite a few times before. Maybe it's the sincerest form of flattery going on there, but hey, it looks good. We've got more ambient lighting here, more stitching going on. We've got two power outlets there. They are USB points, air vents as well. So this is fairly well set up as a family car. I think it will work. The boot, we'll get to that a little bit later in terms of size, but if you wanted to buy this in comparison to something like a Toyota Fortuna or an Isuzu MUX, I feel like there is similar amounts of space on offer in the second row of this Tank 300. So it's a little bit better, I think, than a Jeep Wrangler as a family car. But is it better than the Scorpio? Let's go and have a look. Now, the first thing I notice in this Scorpio in comparison to the GWM is a lack of storage. Firstly, only one cup holder in this Mahindra. And I don't know, maybe I'm being a little bit precious about cup holders, but I feel like you need more than one in a car that's going to be a family vehicle. Two is about the bare minimum, I would say, and then any more than that is fantastic. This only has one little bit of a letdown, I think. And this center console, it's a bit surprising because it looks kind of big and regular from the outside, but then you open it and it's about that deep. You can't fit a whole lot in there. So general storage probably isn't the strength of this Scorpio inside. You do have a wireless charging pad there and there's a bit of storage as well. You could probably throw your wallet on top of your phone or something like that. And you do have a glove box there, but in terms of other storage, there's room for a bottle in the doors. That is about it. What I do like about the interior here, similar to the GWM, is a sense of build quality. This feels very, very solid overall. Well made in that point of view. You've got a good old fashioned manual handbrake. You don't see that too often these days. A Little bit of a shame in a way, but in terms of the way this car feels, especially in comparison to the value for money, it doesn't feel cheaply made. I think that is extremely important. In terms of power outlets here, we've got two USB points up front there and that wireless charging pad that I mentioned before, but no 12 volt outlets. So you may be one step behind there, but not having a 12 volt probably isn't a massive deal in this day and age. In terms of infotainment, 
this display isn't as big as the GWM. In terms of features, it's about the same though. We don't have much in terms of native navigation or digital radio here. We do have Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. It's probably not as big and crisp and quality feeling as the GWM. And also, I'll just point out the boot times as well can feel particularly slow at times. When you start the car up, when you turn it off, when you go into reverse to use the reversing camera, you do feel like you're waiting a little while sometimes for things to happen. But you know what? It's not too bad. And once again, plug your phone in, use the smartphone mirroring. So you're using all of the smarts and technology in your phone. You're not so worried about the operating system as much. We've got a good multifunction display in front of the driver there. Good old fashioned analog, taco and speedo, but the multifunction display does have some good stuff hiding in there. These seats are comfortable. You've got electric adjustment for the driver, manual for the passenger, and you do have some manual lumbar support over here as well, which is helpful on the longer drives. Now, one thing I do want to point out, there are some harder plastics around inside this Scorpio in comparison to the GWM, but like I said, build quality is good. But I think where this Scorpio starts to fall behind just a little bit is the interior ambience and the quality, the feel, I suppose, the vibe of the thing you might say. Not having things like ambient lighting, the flash air vents, the big infotainment display, the mixture of materials that you do get in that GWM, this just feels a little bit more basic, I suppose. Build quality is good, I do really appreciate that, but it just doesn't have the same presence in here. Here's the second row of the Scorpio, and the first thing I notice when I get into this car in comparison to the tank is the amount of visibility you've got. It's actually a little bit better in that regard here. The seating position is higher, so you can see what's going on. The window line is a little bit lower as well, I think, so kids in the back will be happier in this car potentially because they can see what's happening. But of course, this is only a two-seater in the second row. So when you include that third row, you've got six seats. But if you want a boot, I will show you those boots a little bit later. This is effectively only a four-seater vehicle. We do have a walkthrough access there into the third row, which is handy. A bit of storage, I suppose, if you wanted to stick something in the middle there to keep your bulky items. And you've got a couple of armrests, which is nice. In terms of legroom, there isn't as much space as the Tank 300 here. That's my seating position up front as per usual. And I've got enough room here, but it's not as spacious. Headroom is in good supply as well though, similar to the Tank 300. I've got air vents here. I've got one single USB-C power outlet and I've got controls for the air vents in the back here. That is a nice touch. You know what, this isn't too bad. Perhaps not as plush in terms of materials once again and the fit out, but as long as you're happy to fit only two in the back, this isn't too bad. This is the third row of the Scorpio. There's room for two here, and the third row is definitely better than the Tank 300 because the other car doesn't have one at all. Now I'm sitting in here, it is pretty tight. My knees are up against the back here. If I sit back, well, my head's pretty much in the boot and it's up against the roof as well. So you probably want to be a little bit shorter and a little bit smaller overall to be comfortable in the back here. I'm talking about kids, I think, and probably only for the shorter runs. There are no air vents in the back here. We've got speakers and some handles and some lights and a small little storage bin, but that's about it in terms of features. And as you can see, the seat base itself is relatively narrow. So most of my legs are off the ground here more for an occasional setup, or like I said, just for kids running them back from school or that sort of thing. But hey, it's still nice to have. To show you the boot of this Tank 300, because there's a fair bit going on actually in this car. The first thing to point out, we've got a side hinge door there, and you've got this locking function as well. So if it's windy conditions or something like that, you can actually lock that in from closing on you. Not a bad feature to have, but inside, I do like to see 12 volt power. There's also a 220 volt power outlet there. And in terms of space, it's actually not too bad. It's a reasonably wide area, deep enough for most uses, I think. This is visually fairly similar to what you'd see in a Defender 110, I think, or a little bit better than a Jeep Wrangler. You've got a little bit of stuff going on under here, no spare wheel, that's on the back of the door, obviously. There is a subwoofer, but I'll show you this cool trick because I was a bit surprised to find this. Bear with me because it's a little bit fiddly to set up. But you've got some built-in camping equipment in this Tank 300. Check this out. 
There we go. I thought I had to get some circus music going in the background there because I was struggling a little bit. More my fault than the table, but this converts into a very low, small camping table. Maybe not the sturdiest thing in the world, and you might ruin it, I suppose, if you keep using it as a table with spillages and things, but that's pretty handy and quite thoughtful. A bit of a surprising and delighting thing to have in the back of this car. Might come in handy too, I reckon. Let's have a look in the back of this Mahindra. Now, like I did say before, in six seat mode, as you can see, not a whole lot of space going on there. They've tried to really maximize it, I suppose, with the design of this door. It's sort of scalloped out to maximize the space there, but still, that is a really small space overall. Mahindra doesn't quote literage there, but just have a look. You're not gonna fit three weeks worth of groceries in there anytime soon. In terms of this door, it is fairly light. It does take a little bit of a shove to close sometimes, I've noticed. But in terms of the gas strut operation, it's easy to use. And that will probably be handy if you're on a hill or something like that. You need to get this thing open. But when you are in four seat mode, you can pop this seat down like that. I suppose you can use that as a bit of extra shelf space there. Or you can pop this up and out of the way. The important thing to do here, use this hook and throw it around the headrest there. Simple as that. And now you've got a boot space that is a bit bigger, but once again, I don't think it's particularly great. You do only have a four seat vehicle now. In effect, that bench seat does take up a fair bit of space that you can't particularly use. In terms of underneath here, you've got a bit of access for your spare wheel. This has an underslung spare wheel instead of being on the tailgate like in the Tank 300. And there is a bit of your tire change equipment under there as well. Tiny little bit of storage also but I think this is a bit compromised in terms of being a six seater or a four seater. It just doesn't do either of those particularly well in my opinion. We're in the Mahindra Scorpio now, driving around town to get a feel for what it's like. And one of the major differences between this and the Tank 300 is of course, this is a diesel powered vehicle where the Tank 300 uses petrol. This is a 2.2 litre, four cylinder turbo diesel. And it's not too bad of a thing, really. It's probably not as noisy and rough as you might expect. But when you look at the power figures on paper, it's not the fastest car getting around the place. It does a good enough job, I think. It's a solid pass mark in that regard. But you'll get more power and torque out of most other diesels around this segment. But even some second-handers would have a little bit more in terms of performance than this. That being said, it's not too bad. Another thing that's, I suppose, okay is the ride quality in this Scorpio. It feels a little bit old school, I think. It's got a bit of roughness going on from time to time. You can feel the road moving around underneath you. It's okay. I think it's good enough for the job, but it just doesn't feel as good as others in this segment. So when you are comparing the value for money, this is a very well-priced car. It's quite cheap in the segment but you do get those areas where it starts to fall back a little bit as well. So there's one bump there, for example, that is the trade-off. But there's one thing I do want to point out, which is quite frustrating in this car. Come to a stop like this, there you go. Stop start has just kicked in. The engine is off while I'm here waiting to go. It's not the best stop start system in the world. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna turn it off. All right, that's a bit better. Now, let's go. Oh, this thing is not going anywhere, it's in neutral. Because I've turned the stop start off whilst the car was running or stopped, the engine is now off and I cannot turn it back on either. Press the stop start button, that's not working. Oh, that's because I'm still in drive. So I've got to go back to park, hold my foot on the brake, press start, kick the thing over once again, and then go. So if you're in traffic, I don't know if you've driven on a Sydney road before, but everyone behind you will be flying into a rage by this point. And it could be potentially quite dangerous as well. The stop start system, when it is left to its own devices, is a little bit frustrating. It's nowhere near as smooth or responsive as others out there. And that does lead you to want to turn it off. But by golly, do not turn it off at the wrong time because it does cause big issues in this car. Now it's worth pointing out this is a software problem with the vehicle. We have experienced it in other vehicles as well. It's not just this one. Hopefully Mahindra can fix this in the future because it is a major problem. 
One major benefit with this engine being turbocharged and diesel is economy. We've seen numbers well below the 10 litres per 100 mark, even close to 8 litres per 100 when you're driving along the highway for long periods. Around town, you'll probably see a number that's higher than 10, and it will depend upon your driving habits a little bit. But let's say an average of around 10 litres per 100 in most situations is pretty good. But otherwise, this Scorpio, you really do have to keep your eye on that value for money point of view because while it is much cheaper than most other vehicles out there, especially when you consider the inclusions, you are getting a vehicle that maybe isn't as good in some other areas too in terms of the interior layout, the driving experience and the ride quality. So the value for money is there, yes, but it does fall behind a little bit in some other areas. So it will just depend upon you and your own preferences to see if this fits the bill for you. I think the first thing to talk about with this Tank 300 is the ride quality. It's a little bit on the firm side, slightly busy, I would say, but you notice it mostly just around town on those rougher roads, but it's not too bad. If you're expecting the ride quality you get out of a Prado, for example, which is really pillowy and soft, you're not gonna get that here. But it's not too bad overall, I think. I would compare it more closely to a Fortuna or something like that. It's comfortable enough, but the trade-off there is that the thing drives okay. It steers fine, I think. It feels like a four-wheel drive, absolutely, but it's got good manners for general driving around the suburbs and on the highway. A big part of the car's drivability is, I think, the engine. There's no diesel available. You've got a two-litre turbocharged petrol engine here, but it's good. It's a nice, torquey engine that delivers its power not too aggressively, and it's calibrated nicely through the gearbox. It's an eight-speed automatic gearbox and the throttle as well. It makes this thing easy to drive. There's enough performance there, but it doesn't feel like it's overworked at the same time. That's an important balance to make, I think. And in terms of fuel economy, you'll see around 13 to 14 litres per 100 around town, but I did see as good as nine on the highway, so it can be reasonably efficient. It just depends on where and how you're driving it, I think but the powertrain, it's pretty good. And the ride's not bad. And in terms of an everyday driver, this Tank 300 is fairly impressive overall. To sum up the comparison between these two vehicles on the road, the Tank 300 is good, especially considering this is a first generation model. While I would say the Mahindra scrapes by more as a good enough, keeping in mind the asking price. This Tank 300 is the more expensive choice between the two, but it's demonstrably better on road. But of course, you're not gonna buy this thing just to take it on road. You also wanna go off road. So let's have a closer look at that. The inclusion of an automatically locking rear differential is a big help for the Scorpio off-road and it combines well with the traction control system most of the time. However, we could feel that auto locking diff coming off and on in hard situations as we rolled backwards and forwards in challenging spots. And we were also frustrated by the car going back into two-wheel drive at one stage, seemingly on its own volition. While the Scorpio felt mostly quite capable off-road, we found the GWM to be better in just about every respect in terms of capability. There's better clearance overall, a slightly taller tire size, and crucially, locking differentials front and rear make a big difference. On this challenge, it's worth noting, we did take a slightly different line in these hard ruts between the two vehicles, so it's not a direct apples and apples comparison. However, the Tank 300 did feel much more composed and stable, and there was plenty of traction on offer for this challenge. Locking diffs removes all hints of wheel spin, and that rear suspension on the Tank 300 seemed to articulate quite impressively to maintain slow and easy forward momentum. This Mahindra Scorpio, it is impressive when you consider the value for money on offer. Yes, it does have some shortcomings in terms of safety, only one cup holder, off-road, that automatic locker in the rear has its benefits, but it also makes it a little bit jerky and unpredictable. But I think when you consider the value for money, you start to forgive it for a lot of things. It's got turbo diesel power, that engine's not too bad, it rides okay, the interior feels well made, and well, considering value, once again, you can seat six inside, 
you can't really do much other than go second hand directly against this. But this Tank 300, I've got to say, this represents epic value for money as well. It's more expensive. We're looking at just over 50 grand drive away here. But in this comparison, I think I found quite comfortably that it's better off-road. It's a little bit better on-road and it's got a much better cabin with better technology and safety and all those sorts of things. So while you are spending a bit more money, I see it as being money well spent. Off-road, this thing has independent front suspension, but I've got to say, it feels like a Wrangler with independent front suspension off-road. Maybe an old Cherokee or something like that. It feels stable and confident. It's got twin diff locks. It's always an amazing thing. And I don't think I've found the absolute limits of this thing off-road today. It's probably got a little bit more to give. But I like the interior, that five seat layout. You cannot seat six like you can in the Scorpio, but I would argue that the layout here, you can give up that one passenger. You've got a better boot layout and that sort of thing for most of the time. So I prefer it in that regard. The fit and finish is a little bit better as well. And this car has impressed me, especially when you consider that value for money. So for me, this is the choice. But hey, what's fifty to eighty thousand dollars between friends? I reckon you should check out this comparison as well. That's a Nissan Patrol versus a Land Cruiser 300 Series on road and off road. Definitely worth a look.